a relationship, that these institutions imminent upon this ground are inviolable, true, absolute, persistent, eternal, and so on. These would be problematized in a manner that would show they are not, in fact, absolute but contingent. Uh, they are not uh, true but held in question, that they serve certain interests uh, and have certain effects. So there's a political reasoning that comes about uh, in Foucault's notion of problematization, uh, which is both carrying affinities with notions of deconstruction and counterposed. In fact, it behooves us to take a look at how some of these translations work, how what um, the notion of a dispositif, what it produces. When it comes into English, it comes into English as an apparatus, an assemblage, a device deployment. Um, some of the referential tracings of this are very interesting to take a look at. A plan, a measure, a device, equipment or governor. It comes into German as a transitive verb, meaning to put, place, stand, or set, as a reflexive verb, to place oneself. Darstelling is a picture, diagram, description, or account, a graph, or representation. Uh, Gestell, a frame, perimeter, or boundary. All of these things are, in a sense, set loose. All of these things are circulating around uh, a term that Foucault never fully defined. A disposition, for example, may refer to a person's inherent qualities of character, an inclination or a tendency, also the action or consequence of arranging people or things in a particular way. An inclination, a natural tendency to act, uh, but also one having a physical meaning. An inclination is to lie at an angle. It has a, a physical and material instance as well as that of a tendency. Um, a disposition has much the same thing. Um, so all of these referential trailings surround uh, the question of what precisely an apparatus is. Jojo Angaman has read uh, Foucault and is, I think, one of the most um, exacting readers of Foucault and uh, takes up the question implicate in Foucault's determinations of subjectivation although he was as readily and has said here, he is much more interested in processes of desubjectivation de as subjectivation. Um, the curious thing, and uh, here this will signal a kind of uh, relay for me, I'll go into something uh, a bit different. The curious thing is that in both cases, Foucault who wrote uh, so much about uh, the notion of a medical gaze, a psychiatric gaze, a surveillance gaze uh, about how uh, one regards uh, a subject, a population, how conditions of governmentality, of technologies of the self, of reflexivity operate, uh, rarely wrote about technology in uh, a common sense, rarely introduced the question of technics. Giorgio Agamben, who also implies uh, the question of techniques, rarely addresses it as well. There is an opening in that reading between Foucault and Agamben where the question of techniques uh, can be inserted. And I think it's a crucial and important insertion to make. Um, since these are notes, uh, I'm going to move here now, not to a conclusion, uh, but to one place where we might address this. It'll start quite simply with a story. As soon as I get it to call up. In Syria, around 1912, there was a man who traveled from village to village, carrying an old projector, a reflecting lantern, and a single reel of film. 
He made a regular circuit putting on his cinematic spectacles, projecting the silent reel and telling stories about the exotic people who appeared as flickering shadows on the walls or makeshift screens in the various communities that he visited. The film would occasionally break and he would fix it with any adhesive readily at hand. This was a continuous problem. And there was a high attrition rate as the film became more and more worn and damaged. Sometimes the repair became a kind of tacit edit and shots or scenes fell out of sequence or were lost entirely. Moreover, as the man made his rounds, the various townspeople tired of hearing the same stories over and over again so that something very much like a traditional oral epic began to develop. After a while, the man was telling stories not of the people who remained on the screen, but complicated and extended narratives of their relatives, their children, friends and acquaintances, those who were not present within the frame but resided somewhere else outside the image in a sort of evolving and virtual off-screen space. While the story may be apocryphal, there are certain aspects, repetition and plurality, variability, permeability, commutability, virtuality, that are endemic to a register of artifactuality within which cinematic and subsequent media remain salient. While certain of these structural and technological attributes have on occasion been redefined, refined, and deployed as aesthetic or theoretical or political tactics, uh, constrained in the critical transformation of media, for the most part they persist in the public sphere of popular media as merely tacit conditions of possibility, conditions that are for the most part precluded or deferred, suppressed by conventional habits of consumption. There is, in fact, a good deal of anxiety about the containment of such representations, and a sophisticated culture of apprehension and control surrounds and regulates the introduction of new works, new forms, new politics, and new technologies. With changes in these forms of transmission, access, and consumption, there's also a concomitant transformation of the forms of engagement, complicity, resistance, and mediation. In the examination of such things, the questions of subjectivation and desubjectivation set into, are set into occlusion with the problematic of techniques. And there are a few examples. Uh, there's also an epigraph. Charles Hablas Gray says at a certain point, the living system we are a part of is clearly both organic and machinic. Strangely, cinema secures our attention. We have an abiding fascination with visual experience. The act of looking is reflexive, the gaze recognized and sustained is folded back into itself as pleasure. We have an interest in novelty and the revelations of desire, sexuality, and death. The scenes of violence, aggression, the exotic. We have a peculiar curiositas in the very phenomenon of motion and duration, color and form. Disregarding the synthetic origin of the persistence and retention of traces that produce illusions of motion, we invest ourselves in the claims of the cinematic. Our cognitive involvement in its technical and aesthetic topoi forms a complex and enduring pattern of relations between perception, reference, medium, and memory. The perceiving body is inscribed into a register of instrumentation, engaged in prosthetic perceptions which are indistinguishable from and supplementary to its own sensations. Such inscription, of course, has a history, and there are technical substrates of unconscious memory that persist and permeate our relations to the instruments we devise, writing us into the writing of light and movement, shaping and delimiting the forms of attention and modes of address which, in their interaction with specific machinery, recognize the specular as intimately linked with the real. In 1923, Ivan Pavlov describes the reflexive orienting response of human test subjects to sudden noises or shifts in the relative luminosity of objects. Pupils dilate, the brain's alpha activity diminishes, and there is a constriction of the small capillaries. Attention is drawn to novelty in the perceptual environment. It is not at all surprising that cinematic strategies of sound, image composition, editing, and mise-en-scene also operate precisely in this register. The human visual system recognizing a change in luminosity as a change in form gives unconscious credence to our investment in the fidelity of these flickering sensibilia. We have already reacted to a moving image, the trace of a person, for example, as if he or she were present. We presume the deferred presence of somebody as having been, at some time, present before the camera such that it, the device, unintentionally, or someone else behind the camera, intentionally, has observed and faithfully secured the image of the person or event represented. But, as Benjamin has so often reminded us, the camera itself does not see, but rather has prosthetically inserted between the original